also make a few opening remarks and really just frame the issue. The real presentations are going to be done by Catherine Asobi from Brooklyn Legal Services and Megan Freismith from Staten Island Legal Services, who really deserve all the credit for putting this training together. Um, they are just unfortunate enough to have worked with me um, on some federal cases, so I therefore roped them into doing this. Um, but I um, have some opinions about the subject, so I thought it would be helpful to sort of just <coughs> frame the issues. I also wanted to just describe what some of the materials that you've been given are. Um, and um, uh, apologies, they are, it is a pretty uh, thick packet, but we thought it would be helpful to see some real life examples uh, from different contexts. So there's a brief on a motion to dismiss, that's the first uh, set of materials. Uh, and then there are um, a host of sample uh, documents from a couple of cases that were actually uh, litigated uh, in federal court, uh, including a civil docket sheet, which sort of gives you the flavor of the history of one particular case, um, some of the uh, letter motion practice that took place there, discovery demands, and um, some other um, uh, interactions with the court uh, that sort of describe what happened. And, and um, Catherine will talk more about those when she sort of gives her, her case study. Um, I wanted to just um, start us off with sort of talking about the, some of the differences between federal court and state court and why is this even an issue? Uh, conventional wisdom has it uh, that the quality of judges in federal court is much better. Why wouldn't we want to be in federal court if a plaintiff happened to have brought their case in federal court? And while it is true that you often get better quality judging and um, more attention to your case, uh, there are a lot of other things at play that I wanted us to just sort of be thinking about. Um, uh, it can be great to be in federal court if you have an effective advocate handling the case for you. Uh, if you don't have a lawyer, uh, things can go very differently. Uh, the main problem is, is that our foreclosure protections are not built in to federal court whatsoever. So if you default in state court, uh, all is not lost because you will still be called into court for a settlement conference. And most of you probably know that that is the posture a large majority of our clients are in when they, when they get to us. They have probably not answered, uh, but they did uh, get their court notice of, of a settlement conference, and that brought them into court, and that might well be what has connected them with our services. Um, in federal court, uh, if you default, um, the plaintiff is going to be able to get a default judgment um, really, really quickly. It's nothing like getting a default judgment in, in state court. So that's my main concern about uh, these cases uh, proceeding along in, in federal court. Um, it's not necessarily a disaster uh, for the clients who we're representing, and sometimes, in fact, we can accomplish good things. But I think it's important to be aware of the problem for the clients that we're not representing um, and um, think about educating the court and making it not so easy for the plaintiffs to bring these cases in federal court. So we're going to consider a few different ways of, of dealing with it, but um, that's one of the things uh, I wanted to mention. Um, there are other reasons why even if we are litigating a case in federal court, um, it is not necessarily advantageous. Um, the cases are much more closely managed, and there are some judges or magistrates who might end up uh, administering the cases who might keep us on very tight timelines, and that might not necessarily be in our clients' interests. Um, the other uh, issue to be aware of is that um, opposing summary judgment, uh, which we often have to do for our clients, is in some respects a different animal in federal court. Uh, in state court, it is not that difficult to oppose a summary judgment motion, uh, even in a case where there's been little activity and little discovery, and uh, persuade the court that there are disputed issues of fact lurking there. Um, in federal court, um, summary judgments are, are, are governed by Rule 56, and um, it's not enough to just put in an affirmation or an a client's affidavit. Um, which opposes the summary judgment, you have to do um, what's called a Rule 56 statement, 
um, which the plaintiff will also have had to do. They will have to have um, basically put in a statement of everything that is undisputed that supports their claim for summary judgment, uh, which is supposed to reference um, the record in the case or the evidence in the case. But as an opponent of summary judgment, you're required to do a counter Rule 56 statement. So uh, if there has been no discovery and not much has happened, it can be very difficult to oppose a summary judgment motion um, in, um, in federal court. So that's just something else to, to think about. There are also, uh, in general, no interlocutory appeals in federal court. So um, basically, things can happen uh, much quicker, and that may or may not be, be helpful. Um, so, um, so I put some other uh, points up here. Uh, sometimes we might consider federal court more favorable because I think it's fair to say uh, many litigants, or I should say their counsel, uh, might be a little bit more respectful of the court and might take directives from the court a little more seriously. So if you do manage to get yourself in a posture where you're actually having a settlement conference process, if you've managed to educate the court that that's what's supposed to happen, um, they might be uh, far more um, beneficial conferences than what we're accustomed to in state court. Um, so uh, those are some of the concerns that I wanted to uh, um, make people aware of as, as we think about uh, being in federal court. Uh, what we're going to do today is uh, consider two different strategies, uh, or uh, and this is based on sort of two different sets of experience we've had with a few cases. Uh, one is the motion to dismiss strategy, and Megan is going to talk about that because she had uh, a resounding success in one case doing that, uh, not a success with getting the court to actually decide the motion, but literally days after she made a motion to dismiss, um, the plaintiff basically backed off and decided he didn't want to uh, have to deal with her. Um, and I don't mean that personally, but um, he realized it was going to be a lot of work and that he had some real problems in this case. So she's going to talk about uh, some of the federal abstention theories, and I should say that they are theories. They are not slam dunk uh, grounds for dismissal uh, because they are based on the, you know, that they really invite the court to exercise its discretion. And um, but it's it's worth being aware of them. And I think that in the in the sample brief that's included, we made a pretty persuasive showing for why some of those theories really ought to be implicated in the foreclosure context. And Megan will talk about that. Um, that's also an opportunity to raise New York technical defenses, the statutory notices and things like that, as well as substantive defenses. Um, the other prong is, is uh, Catherine is going to talk about because she's actually handled a couple of these cases that got litigated in federal court. Um, and we'll talk about conferencing there and discovery, dispositive motions, um, and it'll, you'll sort of get a picture about you know, how at least one of these cases played out. Uh, before we even get to that, um, we kind of need to understand the basics about why we're even in federal court in the first place. Um, and we're in federal court uh, based generally on diversity jurisdiction. So I'm going to turn the reins over now to Catherine, who's going to give us a little bit of a, of a briefing or perhaps a refresher on things that we haven't thought about uh, since we were in our constitutional law classes in uh, law school, and she's going to sort of go over how um, diversity jurisdiction plays out in foreclosure cases. Thanks, Jay. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about diversity jurisdiction. As Jay said, Megan is going to talk about uh, one of the strategies, which is to seek dismissal on abstention grounds. But before we get to that, we're going to look at the threshold question of how, do you, how does a foreclosure case get to federal court? And what is diversity jurisdiction? So we all know that um, in state court, foreclosures are brought under the Real Property Actions and Proceedings Law. And the cases are venued in the county where the property is located. And that's all pretty simple. In federal court, uh, since foreclosure is not a federal question, you, the federal court would only have jurisdiction under diversity. Um, I did a little research on this, and I found out that diversity comes from Article Three of the Constitution that gives the federal courts jurisdiction over uh, cases between citizens of different states. 
there is a statute. The diversity statute is um, 28 U.S.C. 1332. And I'm going to get into that a little more later. But first I'm going to talk about um, some of the big issues that you will encounter when you're evaluating a case to see if there is diversity jurisdiction. Um, the, the, usually your plaintiff will be diverse. There, there, will, there will usually be diversity between your plaintiff and your defendant homeowner. However, there may be some diversity destroying defendants, nominal defendants such as the New York State Department of Taxation and Finance or the IRS or some other governmental arms. And, and why is that? Well, the diversity, uh, I'm going to just, this is not linear, so I may go back and forth. So the diversity has to be complete. All plaintiffs must be citizens of different states from all defendants. And a state or an arm of the state is not a citizen of any state for diversity purposes. And the United States is not a citizen of any state. So if you have either of those entities as defendants, they are going to destroy your diversity. Um, let me see. I'm going to go back. So those are, that's the first way you might have diversity destroyed. Now, your plaintiff is probably going to be a, a national bank or a debt buyer. National bank servicers have their own sort of special uh, they're special snowflakes because they get to be a state, they, they get to be a citizen of the state where their articles of organization say they are. Um, the, even though your, your national banks are going to be, they're going to have offices and they're going to do business all over the country, they're probably going to be a citizen of an obscure state, in some cases North Dakota, that they designated when they were organized. Um, and I, let me just see, I'm going to go down to, so if your plaintiff is a corporation, they're going to be a citizen of any state where they're incorporated, but also the state where their principal place of business is located. This is a little different from a national bank. The case law says that the national bank gets their citizenship from their main office, which may not be their principal place of business. If your plaintiff is an LLC, they're going to be in a little bit different situation. An LLC is not a corporation. It's a different type of an organization. And an LLC and any other non-corporate association will be a citizen of all of the states, so it could be multiple states, of which its owners are mem or members are citizens. I have not seen really any LLCs bringing federal foreclosures. We have seen national bank servicers uh, national banks either as servicers or national banks themselves or in the case study that we're going to do which involves Eastern Savings Bank which is a federal savings bank and is treated as a national bank. And the policy behind diversity jurisdiction is to keep state residents from having a home state advantage. As Jay has said Foreclosures can move pretty quickly in federal court. We have a lot of state court protections that slow down the process, that give our borrowers a chance to have a settlement conference. And a lot of banks don't want to go through that process. So they're invoking diversity jurisdiction. It's really forum shopping, but the policy behind it is to avoid any possible bias. So I'm going to look at some of the case law. Um, this first came up while we were litigating the first federal foreclosure that I was involved in, and the plaintiff was Eastern Savings Bank, and a, a, a different judge in a different case in the Eastern District, it was Judge Kogan, I believe, sua sponte brought up the issue of the diversity destroying nominal defendants. 
and he held that um, the New York State Department of Taxation and Finance was not a corporation, had no citizenship separate from New York State, there's extensive analysis in the case if you read the entire case. There are some instances where some arms of the state, some state subdivisions might have their own separate corporate citizenship, but in this particular case, Department of Taxation and Finance was a, a defendant, and I believe the IRS may have also been a defendant. Um, yeah, because he, he mentioned that the U.S. could be a defendant in a state foreclosure case, we have um, we have a we have a federal statute that allows the U.S. to be named as a defendant. That's U.S. 28 U.S.C. 2410. All of this was sua sponte. I don't know why. I guess maybe this judge was interested in the issue, and and maybe he he felt like this was a way to to slow down the case or or, or get the attention of the plaintiff. But he wrote this long decision, sua sponte, and what he did was, he, after finding um, the non-citizenship of the U.S. and the non-citizenship of Department of Taxation and Finance, he, he did allow the plaintiff to dismiss those diversity-destroying defendants. So you're, you're probably thinking, well, what do we care? You know that plaintiffs name all kinds of defendants. I know in New York City they name all kinds of city entities as well as the state and federal entities, and they may name a lot of other creditors, second lien holders. The, in general, the, the government liens may not be very big, and so maybe those government entities are not necessary parties, and in, in this in the case, uh, in this case, Eastern Savings versus Walker, and in the case that I was litigating at the time, Eastern Savings versus Hart, the plaintiff did decide that they would drop those defendants. Probably, the, maybe the liens didn't exist anymore. Maybe they were small dollar amounts. But what Judge Kogan said in Eastern Savings Bank versus Walker was that while he would allow them to drop these defendants. He cautioned the plaintiff that if the case went to auction, he was not guaranteeing them that any sale would be considered a commercially reasonable sale because any conveyance of the property would be subject to these liens. Since these entities, if they still had liens, had been dropped from the case and what any, any liens that still existed would not have been extinguished as to those particular defendants. Um, now, we get a different result when we go to uh, different parts of the country. Uh, I'm going to go, I'm sorry, I'm going to go to national banks now. So, so that's the kind of the state of play with the diversity destroying defendants. Now we're going to look at, at national banks. and. Since they're going to be the bulk of the plaintiffs in federal cases, the Eastern Savings Bank is, is kind of an outlier. Um, the main the main case that uh, establishes the citizenship of a national bank is Wachovia Bank versus Schmidt, and that's a Supreme Court case from 2006. It was actually Justice Ginsburg. She read the statute and she decided that the National Bank is located because the, the statute refers to where it's located as to where it's a citizen. It's located and is a citizen of the state where its main office as designated in the Articles of Association is located. This reversed a Fourth Circuit holding that said that a national bank plaintiff was a citizen of each state where it had its branches. Now, in dicta, she noted that in almost every case, their principal place of business and their main office designated in the Articles of, of Association were going to be the same place. And she didn't think that was going to be uh, much of a problem. However, it is going to be a problem as we see in other circuits. But in the Second Circuit, 
they have followed this and extended it to say that in cases where the National Bank plaintiff does uh, has its main office under those articles in one state, in a lot of cases it might be North Dakota because the National Bank wants to export North Dakota's usury statute all over the country. And obviously their principal place of business is not in North Dakota, their headquarters isn't there. However, in the Second Circuit, the Southern District and the Eastern District have both said they are not going to make that national bank a citizen of the state where it has its principal place of business if that is a different state from its main office as defined in Wachovia Bank versus Schmidt. So the two cases involving uh, that standard are, one is in the Southern District, Excelsior Funds versus J.P. Morgan Chase, and the other one in the Eastern District, One West versus Joam. And um, just a note, One West is bringing a lot of foreclosures in the Eastern District. I don't know about the other, other parts of the state. Interestingly enough, in the Ninth Circuit in California, the courts are the district courts are reaching a different result, where a lot of homeowners are bringing affirmative litigation against their lenders or their national bank servicers on the basis of the California Homeowner Bill of Rights, and that's a state statute. And California is a non-judicial state, so I imagine that these homeowners are, are doing their national bank servicers to maybe to stop a sale or after a sale and in a lot of cases the servicers are removing those suits to federal court on diversity grounds. Several of the district courts in California are not following Wachovia versus Schmidt to the extent that the courts in the eastern and southern districts are. They are remanding those cases back to state court and saying that those national bank servicers have two states of, of citizenship. Um, I, th I think maybe Wells Fargo might be one of them that has its principal place of business in California. So where you have a California homeowner in Wells Fargo, they are saying that uh, there's no diversity there. I just highlighted another case here. It's, um, this is a California case, it's, it's, and it, it's, it's one of these um, that I've just described. And it, I just put this in because it gives you a good kind of a discussion of diversity jurisdiction if you, if you would like that. Okay, so I guess we're going to go to Megan now. Um, I, I think we discussed possibly taking questions, so yep. I don't know so, if there are any questions. Yep, so we just have... Um, one question related to the substance, and it's somewhat off topic, but the question is for housing counselors that are on the call, um, what role can housing counselors play if the case is filed in federal court? I think their role is, is really going to be to refer the homeowner to legal counsel as soon as possible. They may still be able to work with the borrower in terms of preparing a loan modification application. I think they're just going to have to keep in mind that the standards are very high in federal court and they, if they are going to continue to be involved, maybe the borrower has counsel, hopefully they have counsel, but if the housing counselor is going to be involved while the case is in federal court, you've got to keep impeccable records. So, and I would also add that for those of you who are in upstate where you regularly will go to court with your homeowners and you're working in tandem or sometimes on your own in front of the judge or the, the mediator, um, that's not likely to be treated with the same level of open arms in federal court. Um, but I would, on a, on a side note in terms of practice points, I would suggest that the housing counselor work with the attorney closely on these cases. Hopefully you're able to get an attorney to help help these homeowners with it, um, but that you should um, be following the guidance of the attorney on the case. Um, okay, so a couple of more questions here. Uh, what would be the citizenship of a securitized trust, and where could we find that information? Well, um, uh, that's an interesting question. You know, I haven't thought of that. I, the plaintiff in, in a 
in the cases where the loan is securitized, the plaintiff is the trustee, and the trustee is usually a national bank. And the national bank is probably not going to be a citizen of New York because uh, it's probably not organized in New York. So I suppose that um, I, ha I haven't broached the topic of the citizen of a trust? That's, that's a good question. I, I can't really answer that except to say that I know that we do treat the trustee as the plaintiff because I, I don't think the trust itself ha has a life of its own. I think it has to, to sue through the trustee. So it would be the citizenship of the trustee. Okay. As far as I know. All right. So I think we'll leave that there. So um, Megan, are you next? Okay. Hello, everybody, and thank you, Catherine, and thanks, Jay, for that lovely introduction. I think it's totally fair to say that Alan Weinreb really does not want to have anything to do with us, um, so he withdrew that uh, pretty quickly out of federal court. Um, all right, so I am uh, going to talk about pre-answer motions to dismiss. Um, so basically, you know, instead of submitting an answer um, like we usually do in state court, um, either a pro se answer or, you know, a more fulsome answer where you're, you know, denying the allegations and bringing counterclaims or um, other defenses, you know, in federal court, you may want to move to dismiss the action um, right away before um, submitting the answer. So one thing that you are going to want to look at is whether the time to answer or otherwise, you know, submit a, your first response to pleading has already passed. So in federal court, you have 21 days to answer after service of process. Um, and service um, under the federal rules um, is found under Rule 4E. And basically, it can be service any way that service is permitted by the state rules. It can be in person or it can be just left at um, the address with someone of suitable age and discretion. So 21 days is obviously not a lot of time, particularly when a lot of our clients don't uh, bring this to our attention right away. Um, so, you know, once you find out that your client has been served, the first thing, you know, you may want to consider is just asking opposing counsel counsel to consent to extend your time to answer or to move. So regardless if you're going to bring a motion to dismiss or if you're going to answer, you probably are going to need more time anyway. So you would do that just, you know, the way that you would do that in state court, you know, and you would file a stipulation just to extend the time to answer or move. Um, and that stipulation is, you know, a basic stip that you would do in state court, a uh, little one page, and you would file that. Um, through the federal system. Um, as far as moving to dismiss, um, or I'm sorry, um, if, the, if the answer has already been due, um, again, you may want to ask opposing counsel um, to extend the time to answer, uh, just get their take on, on submitting a late answer or a motion. You also may want to check your judge's rules, um, his or her local rules, um, to see if there's anything in there about late answers or, you know, if you need to contact the court uh, to request, you know, more time to answer or to move. Um, another thing that I've heard um, some people doing is actually having the client or the borrower themselves go to the actual courthouse um, and talk to one of the pro se um, help desks, and I've heard that um, they will help the client actually submit um, a letter um, asking for more time. And you know, we have seen the judges extend the time, um, kind of pro se. So that's something you could either advise the client to do right away, or you could even go with the client. Um, this probably is only going to work if they're a couple of weeks late. You know, if we're talking six months late, you know, I'm not sure, you know, kind of what hope there is, uh, but that's something you'd want to look into in your own jurisdiction, um, you know, what you would want to do. Um, the other consideration um, for moving to dismiss um, is whether or not your judge uh, requires a pre-motion conference. 
before you can submit your motion or whether you can just go ahead and, and, and serve the motion and file it without ever really involving the court. So I have um, included an example of a judge's own local rule. So this is Judge Mouskoff, um, and you can see kind of the, the website, you know, where you'd want to go to check um, all of the judge's rules, depending on who you have. Uh, this is for the Eastern District. Um, and so you can see that Judge Mouskoff has um, a pre-motion conference rule. Um, and it's number two, so for any dispositive motion, so that would be a motion to dismiss, um, a pre-motion conference is required and the movement needs to send a letter to the court requesting the conference before um, he or she can even move to dismiss. And Catherine can talk a little bit more about this because she had to do this in her case. In my case, I did not have to do this because our judge didn't have this requirement um, that we needed to have a conference before we made our motion. Okay, so one of the main things that, you know, I'm going to talk about in a pre-answer motion to dismiss is the uh, doctrine of abstention. So this is basically where a federal court would decline jurisdiction that it would otherwise have um, because there's some compelling reason why the state court would want to hear the case or be the court to make the decision um, in that particular action. So abstention is really rooted in federalism and preserving the balance between state and federal sovereignty um, and so that there's no real undue interference um, by the federal court with certain state policies or some kind of um, administrative scheme. Um, a lot of courts um, actually use the phrase harmonious federalism uh, when they talk about abstention. So just a few things to note about abstention. You know, as Jay mentioned, it's discretionary. Um, it's, it's really not terribly common, um, mostly because, you know, the federal court is, is having to give up jurisdiction that it would actually otherwise have, uh, which they are not, you know, which they are not going to do very lightly. Um, and abstention is governed by um, Supreme Court doctrines, which I'm going to go into in a little bit. And just to note, there are no federal cases in New York that have dealt with foreclosures um, and the abstention doctrine. All right, so these are um, a few of the doctrines uh, governing abstention. These are not going to apply to foreclosures, so I will just quickly cover them. Um, the Pullman doctrine. Uh, just says that abstention is appropriate when federal court is presented with uncertain state law and state court interpretation of the state law issue may avoid fed the federal constitutional question. Um, the Younger Doctrine um, states that where there are ongoing state proceedings um, and, the, and the parties have an adequate opportunity to raise their federal claims, um, that the federal court may not want to intervene. So that could be, for example, where um, somebody's being prosecuted and, and they want to claim, you know, the constitutionality of the statute under which they're being prosecuted. The federal court may leave that to the, to the states. And the Colorado River Doctrine is really a doctrine um, for judicial economy. It just says that where there's a parallel state action pending, um, and, and uh, after review of the six-part test that, you know, they may, that the federal court may also want to leave it to the state court to decide. So like I said, these are not really going to apply to foreclosures, uh, but this doctrine, the Burford Doctrine, uh, might. So under Burford, um, the federal court decided, or I'm sorry, the Supreme Court decided that federal, that abstention is appropriate where federal review of a case presenting a state law issue related to complex state regulations would be disruptive of state efforts to establish a coherent policy with respect to a matter of substantial public concern. And then there was a case from 1959, another Supreme Court case, Thibodeau, which kind of um, broke down the Burford Doctrine a little bit more um, and also relates to kind of 
the issue of, of whether or not there's just such a compelling interest for the state that the federal court would not want to intervene. So this has to do with policies, again, a lot of administrative regulations come into play under this doctrine of abstention, and it's really going to be the doctrine that, you know, we're going to use um, in foreclosures. Um, and which we will get into, you know, in detail in just a minute. Um, I just wanted to make a note on preclusion. So abstention is really not going to be the doctrine that you'd rely on if, for example, there is um, a final judgment in a state court um, and, and the plaintiff is bringing a federal action. So, you know, you're going to rely on the general principles of preclusion um, if that were be, to be the case. You know, we're not really seeing um, dismissals with prejudice in state court, so that may not come into play, but th that is different than abstention. And as you read some of the cases on abstention, you know, you may also see um, um, references to the Rooker-Feldman doctrine, and that just um, is a doctrine that says a state court loser cannot seek review of a state court judgment by a federal district court. Okay. So I'm going to get into some of the New York-specific uh, case law on abstention. Uh, like I said, there are no New York cases dealing specifically with foreclosure. So these are going to have, uh, you know, very different fact patterns and, and issues at play. Uh, but, you know, there is a way to, you know, make comparisons um, with these cases to what we would be doing um, in a foreclosure. So the first case is a recent Second Circuit case from 2009. It has to do with New York workers' compensation law. And this case applies kind of this distilled Burford doctrine. So if you go back a couple slides, it's kind of a combination of that, of Burford and Thibodeau. Um, and so they look at two uh, factors. One, um, whether there are difficult questions of state law bearing on policy problems of substantial public import whose importance transcends the result in the case at bar, or uh, whether the exercise of federal review of the question in a case and in similar cases would be disruptive of state efforts to establish a coherent policy. So in this case, you know, the, the court decided that um, workers' compensation laws were highly regulated in New York. Um, there is a workers' compensation board. There's a workers' compensation law judge um, where um, employees would have administrative review. Um, and then specifically by statute, the third department uh, would be the department to actually review those administrative decisions. Um, and so the court had found that there was, you know, judicial expertise dealing with workers' compensation, um, and therefore it applied um, abstention and decided not to hear the case. Um, another case is Smith um, from the Second Circuit. Now in Smith, uh, the court actually um, applied what they called the Thibodeau Doctrine, um, you know, whether that's its own doctrine or not is kind of, I think, up for debate, but, you know, I, I kind of used both in my brief and kind of distilled both of them. Um, in this case, they actually applied both factors from Thibodeau. Uh, I just wanted to note that I've actually never seen any other court um, require that both factors be um, proven, you know, in order for the court to abstain. It's usually many factors or kind of an or test. Um, and so in Smith, actually, the court had found that, you know, they adopt a broad view of abstention, and that's why I kind of actually like this case, and I think that's how I cited it in my brief, uh, because it, it, I think it's kind of the broadest case out there. Um, and may help kind of make the link from um, administrative review and policies to, you know, the foreclosure context. Okay, another case, um, this case actually deals with um, homelessness, 
um, and uh, certain state and federal claims related to emergency shelters. Um, in this case, uh, the court actually looked at four different factors um, and kind of weighed each of them um, in making its determination that the that homelessness is really a matter of state concern. They had noted that local officials were in the process of, of formulating different policies and they didn't want to disrupt that. Um, and they, you know, they also noted that the state already has administrative review under social services law. So again, kind of an administrative review process kind of leading um, you know, the, the rationale behind abstention in this case. Okay, so those the last three cases that I just discussed, I you know I kind of wanted to give you a, a look at the different factors that the courts look at, um, you know these the and or test or whether it's just a, a broad kind of look at what's going on in the state. Uh, the next few cases are really just um, to give you kind of a flavor of other abstention cases in New York that you can cite too, so different fact patterns and and their holdings. So in, in this case, Moose, this is a landlord tenant case. Um, again, you know, the court is noting that there are various administrative boards um, that review these types of issues. Um, also noting that housing is um, a local concern and it's already controlled by state legislation. And in the Corcoran case, this is an insurance case. I will note that most of these cases are insurance cases. Uh, that is because insurance is highly regulated in New York and in other states, for example, Connecticut. Um, there are a lot of administrative and judicial review, um, a lot of legislation dealing with insurance. Um, so you're going to see a lot of cases dealing um, with the insurance context. Um, and again, in this case, you know, it, it, this case has to do with um, the liquidation proceedings um, and the state insurance fund. And the court found that there, you know, the superintendent of that is the one who has the expertise to actually, um, you know, liquidate. And um, also noting that there's a lot of public concern. Uh, from the other state entities who have to contribute to the fund and that the state really has the expertise on these issues. And lastly, this is not a New York case, but it is a federal case that does um, address foreclosures. So, you know, this case I would definitely recommend um, everyone take a look at. Um, this case, um, in Nevada, they, they also have um, foreclosure mediation programs. It's a little unclear whether that is more akin to an administrative review in Nevada, uh, but certainly there's a lot, of, um, a lot of kind of nuggets in this case that would apply uh, to New York and to you know, making the comparison from you know, this case to New York's foreclosure scheme. Um, so I would uh, re recommend that everybody read this case. And again, just a few other cases uh, that you may want to take a look at uh, if you know when you're when you're drafting a brief if you need to. Um, and these are not I'm you know these are not like the the six or seven best cases in New York. I've actually I put these in the slides because they really are the only cases. Um, and so this is kind of the breadth of of Burford abstention uh, that that you could use uh, that's relevant here. And like I've noted, um, a lot of these cases deal with administrative agencies or actions or proceedings. Um, and certainly there are cases where the courts have found that abstention is not warranted uh, because, you know, it's not just an issue of insurance or, you know, here there's child welfare services. There's really um, a fine line between you know whether the the federal court can just deal with the question or whether there's some you know kind of extra state interest um, in these matters uh, so it's important to know that that these cases 
where the court didn't abstain are out there so that you can try to make comparisons um, with a foreclosure. Okay, so how do all these cases relate to what we do, which would be moving to dismiss um, on abstention grounds in a foreclosure matter? Um, so the, you know, one of the first things, kind of an overarching um, theme of what we would want to argue is that really, you know, real pro property issues have kind of always traditionally been a matter of state concern. Um, and then as far as, you know, comparing foreclosure uh, to, you know, the other cases that we've just looked at, you know, you're going to want to establish that there's some, um, you know, foreclosure scheme, uh, a, you know, very compelling state interest in the state court being the court to hear foreclosures. You know, so one of the things that, you know, you should mention are all of the, you know, the statutory scheme that we have in New York. So the reason we have all of these great state protections and foreclosures is because of um, the legislative action um, going back from 2008 and the amendments to the mortgage lending reform law. And so from those laws, you know, we get the mandatory settlement conferences, we, we get the um, real property and proceeding law uh, notice requirements and filing requirements. And then, you know, later on we have the, um, the Certificate of Merit requirement. So all of these things are really, you know, statutorily created and kind of, you know, lean towards this, you know, very uh, compelling state interest that New York has in regulating foreclosures. Um, there's also administrative regulations, so you can cite to uh, DFS Business Conduct Rule Part for 19, um, and that basically goes into um, requirements of servicers to engage in loss mitigation. It governs kind of day-to-day -day dealings with servicers, um, and also has a you know a complaint um, forum, so you can also you know file your complaints regarding servicers directly to the DFS. And then lastly, um, court rules. Um, I think this is really, you know, where the link to those other cases comes from. You know, we don't, foreclosure in New York is not necessarily administrative, but the fact that we have foreclosure settlement conferences with referees and judges who, who deal with foreclosures, you know, almost every day is very akin to kind of the administrative expertise that a lot of the, the cases um, really focus on. So, you know, I would, I think even in our brief, we kind of broke uh, this up into kind of statutory and administrative regulations and then a, a whole section on kind of the, the court expertise um, in dealing with foreclosures. Okay. So in addition to kind of using the statutes um, to support the, you know, abstention, they also might provide, you know, technical defenses and, and technical um, reasons why, you know, you could uh, that the case could also be dismissed. Um, so I'm kind of moving on from abstention and going into a little bit more detail of other um, claims you may want to bring. So we have uh, the 90-day notice, the help for homeowners notice, filing requirements, and again the the certificate of merit. So you could bring these under um, a 12B6 um, motion to dismiss, a failure to state a claim, uh, since these are um, condition precedent pleading, so the, the plaintiff would need to actually plead that they've complied with um, these technical requirements. And then um, lastly, substantive defenses. So you know, again, standing is always going to be a big issue um, in foreclosures, regardless uh, whether it's in state or federal court. Uh, just one thing to note, though, you know, standing in federal court is, is jurisdictional, so it's not necessarily waived. Uh, but since it is waived under New York law, just important to always remember that you probably should just put it in the answer if you're going to answer. 
so that you know you don't risk it being waived. Um, and a standing uh, defense uh, could be brought under a 12b1 motion for subject matter jurisdiction. Um, it could also be a 12b6 um, for uh, failure to establish the prima facie case. Um, again, statute of limitations uh, and 12b6 in general failure to state a claim. Um, so, you know, the complaint just in general may not satisfy the strict pleading requirements uh, that plaintiffs have to have in federal court. Um, so outside of standing, you know, you could raise, you know, that the complaint doesn't, doesn't have any details as to, you know, the amount owed or interest rate or any of the details um, related to this particular defendant. So the pleading requirements for federal um, complaints says, you know, that you can't just state the elements of the cause of action. Um, so you may have something there too. Um, and then the rest of these are just kind of um, things that may apply to your case. Um, and certainly there could be other, other things that you may want to bring up that are not listed here. But, you know, as far as abstention and kind of moving to dismiss, you know, I will just say kind of in closing that these cases um, are very complicated. Um, you know, I, I would read all of the case law if you're going to, to brief the abstention issue. Um, it's very nuanced. The cases are very long. Um, and, you know, I, you know, if you ever want to discuss this, I would say to, you know, come to Jay or to me or to Catherine, um, you know, if you think you're going to bring, you know, a motion to, dis to dismiss with abstention as one of its one of your main theories. So I think that's all I have. I know that was riveting for everyone. Um, and I think I guess we'll take questions now. Yep, so we have one question so far, and it's more about the reaction of the judges in federal court. So the actual question is, are the judges in federal, federal courts happy to see mortgage foreclosure actions being brought in federal courts? Uh, and he has an example that he had a mortgage foreclosure case brought in county court and the judge was not pleased the plaintiff brought the case in that court. This is Megan. So I don't think I can address that. I mean, my case was withdrawn, you know, almost immediately. So I never even saw a judge or had any communication with the judge. And maybe that's something Catherine, you know, would want to go into because she's going to address, you know, kind of actually litigating a foreclosure. Um, and, and and this is Kath, Catherine. I just wanted to jump in and just say that um, it, it uh, I I never had an, uh, enough interaction with the district court judges to get their take on this. But in, I worked with the same magistrate in two cases, and I was able to impress upon her, uh, you know, the the kind of flood tide that she might expect, and and she was horrified. She, I felt, did not want to have to deal with hundreds and hundreds of these cases. So there's, um, the, in, on, in one sense, there's a little bit of a dismissiveness by the federal courts in that they, at the outset, I think um, this magistrate thought this is kind of cut and dried. But once she got into it, she realized there was a lot of nuance and she realized how much work was involved and I, I don't believe she was happy. But Jay may want to and, say more. Yeah, I'll just add my own perspective, which is not based on anything concrete. But uh, first of all, I would say that um, most federal judges have a very high opinion of themselves. And it wouldn't be surprising to me if at least some of them think that uh, what they would view as routine high volume foreclosure litigation is beneath them and doesn't belong in federal court. But at the same token, we were surprised that in one of Catherine's cases where we did do the pre-motion conference exercise, the judge projected that he was underwhelmed um, by the abstention theory. And when, it, But it provided an opportunity to educate the court about what was supposed to happen, and it got us into a settlement conference process. So, you know, I can't say that these abstention theories are going to prevail, but it's an opportunity to educate the court about what's supposed to happen in a foreclosure case. And it's often 
a very blatant example of forum shopping in both of the cases um, that um, uh, Catherine and uh, Megan are talking about. There had been a prior unsuccessful uh, foreclosure case. So I think it's an opportunity. The courts generally don't like the idea of gaming the system and forum shopping. So I think if you can, in particular, emphasize the forum shopping aspect of it and the effort to evade the state law protections, um, it can make the argument stronger. Um, so. OK, so uh, another question is, can you move for abstention post-answer? Or can the uh, abstention be incorporated, can the abstention argument be incorporated into an answer? And well, I can, I can t try my hand at that, and Catherine may want to jump in. It's a, it's a bit of a challenge. I mean, the, the, this is most impactful when it's done by way of a pre-answer motion to dismiss. Um, it's a little harder. You know, once the case is already go going uh, in federal court, it's, it's, it can be, I think it would be difficult to sort of persuade a judge, like, let's call things off, I'm going to all of a sudden abstain. Um, but if you're coming in late in the game and getting permission to put in a late answer or move with respect to the answer late, then I don't see why you shouldn't or, or couldn't include as part of that, you know, abstention. I will also say that in, in Catherine's case, and maybe she was going to talk about this, and I apologize if I'm jumping on that, but um, when it was clear that the judge was not um, terribly impressed with the abstention argument and it was instead necessary to put in an answer and litigate the case, we didn't abandon it. We did preserve the defense and, and, and plead it in the answer, and that answer is in the materials. So it is an option um, if you're not able to you know, pull together a motion right away, um, you can at least preserve the defense and an answer and think about making the motion, motion later. Yeah, I mean, I, I, this is Catherine. I mean, I think that uh, we, we did preserve it in, in the answer in the case that I'm getting ready to talk about. But at the same time, we were bringing counterclaims, so I think it was a little bit, um, should I say, disingenuous of us to hold on to that as a defense because we were really, we, we wanted the court to rule on our counterclaims. So I don't think that it would have gone anywhere later in the case once we had engaged in settlement conferences and if we had, you know, if we'd gone forward with litigating our counterclaims, obviously. Um, okay, I'm, I'm not certain I fully understand the question, but I'll put it out there. Maybe uh, it'll make more sense for others. So uh, what about using an analogous argument to stop plaintiff's attorneys from bringing mere actions on notes? but not to foreclose the mortgage, also thus circumventing the settlement conference phase. Um, and um, so they're bringing it on the note, just for collection on the note. And then it's in state court trying to bring mere actions on the note and not on the mortgage to evade the settlement conference phase. So that is a thing. Uh, we've seen that. In fact, I think Megan, if I'm not mistaken, had one of those cases as well. It was in state court, though. It wasn't brought in federal court. Right, uh, in and state in that, court. And what that p particular case implicated was they failed to serve um, a 90-day notice, um, taking okay. the position that it's not an action, a foreclosure action. They didn't need to do that. And there have been at least one or two trial-level decisions um, which held, no, the language in 1304 talks about an action on a note. Uh, it doesn't limit itself to foreclosure. So that aspect of the protection is, is at least governed, um, you know, is, is, is in play. Um, but I don't know about the settlement conference. I, I don't think you'd have much of an argument under CPLR 3408 for the settlement conferences, um, you know, based on a strict action on the note. It might happen in Staten Island uh, because it seems there if they see anything having to do with a mortgage on their own, they'll sometimes just put the case in before the, the foreclosure part. Um, but uh, I haven't seen this, though, as an issue in a federal case. OK. I, hadn't, I haven't seen it at all, so I guess that's why I got a bit lost. So all right, uh, that's it We for now for questions.
Okay, so moving on, we're, we're, this is Catherine, and now we're going to go to a case study. And I apologize, I don't have a huge amount of slides for this case study. I'm going to direct you to page 47 of your materials, which is the beginning of the civil docket sheet. And I'm going to just go through kind of the chronology of the case. There are settlement conferences kind of interspersed throughout this, but I think the easiest way is just going to be to go through the history, and I'll talk about some of the issues that came up as I go through the chronology of the case. Um, this case was brought by Eastern Savings Bank, which is a federal savings bank out of Maryland, and although they, you know, they call themselves a savings bank and, and they have a lot of brick and mortar, they really seem to have operated more as a national predatory lender. Uh, I did a lot of research and looked at a lot of their reports and saw that they did a lot of their lending in New York, Philadelphia, D.C., um, Chicago, Los Angeles, and pr their business model was a little bit different than a lot of the other originators during the boom, they held these loans on their portfolio. Um, so they had a lot of skin in the game. They loaned, uh, they issued the loans really based on the value of the collateral and, and not based on the ability to pay. And although pretty much none of the originators were really uh, doing underwriting with regards to ability to pay, Eastern did their underwriting in terms of the value of the property. And in terms of the loan-to-value ratio, they made sure that they were covered. They also had a lot of other vehicles that they used. Um, interestingly, the attorneys that represent them in every case, in the Eastern District anyway, Chris and Feuerstein, also did all the closings of all these loans. And I suspect they probably um, have an interest in the bank itself. Um, but they, they did very detailed appraisals. They um, were aggressive in making sure that loan-to-value never went above 60 or 70 percent. And, um, and the loans were marketed through brokers. There wasn't really any visible advertising, but they were marketed through brokers to people with bad credit, sometimes pe people that were already behind in the case of refinancings, um, and sometimes people that were in foreclosure. And the interest rates would generally start at 10, 11, 12 percent. Um, the way they got around some of the high cost loan statutes, like HEPA, was that the loans were called step down loans, and every six months or so the interest rate would go down. So I guess when you did your calculations of your APR for your TILA truth and lending disclosures, Overall, the interest rate would be a little bit lower when you when you calculated your overall APR, but the uh, the note rate at the outset was always very high, and in many cases the payments were just impossible. And so these loans were really didn't provide a benefit to a lot of the borrowers because there were a lot of fees associated. You know, maybe two to three points to a broker. And um, by the time you added in all the closing costs, you had a borrower that m maybe uh, owed 450000 and then after they refinanced, you know, maybe they owed 550000 with almost no cash out. So that's kind of the background on Eastern Savings. So when this case was brought, I had already litigated one case with Eastern Savings, and and I, I kind of had an idea of what was going on, although this was a little bit different. So if you look on the first page here, on page 47, um, you'll see that right in the middle of the page, right as soon as the case was filed on August 16, 2012, in accordance with uh, Rule 73 of the Federal Rules, it was assigned to a magistrate, and um, the parties were given the option to allow the case to be decided by the magistrate. I, uh, I, I've never done this. Um, I think if I was going back, what I know about this magistrate, I, I might possibly have consented to that. 
but you have to have both sides. It's voluntary. Um, if one side wants to consent to the, have the magistrate decide and the other doesn't, it, it doesn't really matter. Uh, nothing, the court never knows about it. So going down the page, um, you'll see that this borrower did a pro se motion for extension of time to file an answer. They did that a little bit before they came to us. And um, if you go to the next page, 48, um, I'll just refer to these by docket entries. Um, she had done that on September 21st, and then by September 25th, when you see entry number 16, uh, by in four days the court had granted the pro se borrower's motion for an extension of time to answer. So that's that's one great aspect of the pro se office and and I guess the federal court in general. Things move quickly. Uh, it's a, it's a two-edged sword. It's sometimes it's good for our clients and sometimes it's very bad, as Jay said they can get default judgments against them pretty quickly. So when we got this case, we were really fortunate. The homeowner had an extension of time to answer, and then we appeared a couple weeks after. Uh, obviously, we had done some preparation before, and, and upon a, making the appearance, we filed a pre-motion conference letter. And that letter is at page 57. So we were seeking a motion to dismiss on abstention grounds, as Megan discussed, and this was before Judge Mouskoff. Um, now, once we filed that, we were kind of on a dual track because we we filed the pre-motion conference letter, and that was although it was dis directed to the district judge. District Court Judge, Judge Mouskoff, the magistrate responded. And once we, we filed that and then um, the other side filed their opposition, we immediately got a scheduling order issued and a telephone settlement conference was set with the magistrate. And this was, so we're, I'm still on page 49 of the materials, talking about October 23rd, 2012. So this was our first round of settlement conferences. And at this point, the bank was pretty much not interested. By way of background, one of the reasons we took this case was that there had been a previous state court case. It was dismissed for a failure to serve the RPAPL 90-day notice. And in the state court case, one of uh, the referee or one of the referees that had presided over settlement conferencing had issued a very brief directive but the directive said that he determined that Eastern was not negotiating in good faith because they refused to reduce the interest rate below I think it was nine or nine and a half percent and we felt like this was a hook for us to bring the issue of good faith negotiations to the attention of the federal court, it, it was part of the basis of what would have been our um, our motion to dismiss on abstention grounds. And then later on, we used it. I used it in settlement conference negotiations, and we later, uh, towards the end, after discovery was completed, we were using it as a basis of a, uh, a what would have been a cross motion for interest tolling and we were going to ask for interest tolling going back to the state court action. So uh, in October, November of 2012, you can see that we had um, telephone conferences and there was a little bit of rescheduling there. Um, and there's not a lot of detail um, in the notes, just the settlement discussions continued. But I can tell you at that point, the bank was really offering nothing. Um, their typical posture was, you pay us, oh, I don't know, 50 or 60 percent of the arrears, and we'll reduce your interest rate by half a point for 24 months. And we, we might put the rest of the arrears on the back end of the loan, but you'll go back to you know, the predatory interest rate. And that obviously wasn't happening. So 
from the beginning, I was explaining to the magistrate about HAMP. Even though Eastern didn't participate in HAMP, I was constantly um, invoking HAMP as the industry standard and something that the plaintiff should really be aspiring to. And I, I was constantly also talking about net present value because this property was underwater at that point. It, the um, the note amount was five hundred and forty thousand. I know that sounds like a lot to you people upstate, but that's that's pretty common down here. And it had been in default for over three years, and with all of the interest and their interest had accumulated on the escrow advances, um, we felt that it it was really worth less than what was owed at that point. So. I started working on the magistrate and saying, look, they, they need to take into account the time value of money and what we can offer them and, and look at the fact that if this house is auctioned today, they're not going to get all their money back. And I wasn't getting too far in the beginning. So then we moved to December 2012. We had our pre-motion conference. As Jay said, that didn't go so well. Judge Mouth Cough was not really interested. Um, she did express confidence in her magistrate, Magistrate Judge Go. And when we brought up all these issues about the settlement conference scheme in state court, she said that her magistrate could conduct conferences just as well as they could in state court. And so, in a way, that was good for us because we then decided that we would treat our future settlement conference as if they were 3408 conferences. And so we were going to use, uh, we we're going to have a strategy that if plaintiff would negotiate in good faith with us, well then we were going to apply 3408 and try to get some relief later on because we were pretty sure they weren't going to negotiate in good faith. Um, so pretty soon after we had that conference, we had to file a status report and we said that we were not going to make the motion at that time. Then soon thereafter, the court um, scheduled an initial conference. Now we were going into another round of settlement conferences and talking about discovery. So I'm just going to, so we're now at rule, going back to the slides, we're now at rule 26 conference. And um, so when you have this conference, rule 26 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure says that the parties have to they can't they don't they're not allowed to wait for disclosure requests, discovery requests. They've got to go ahead and produce what they have at the outset. So I just wrote a couple of tips. If you're in federal court and you have this conference, um, you can go ahead and make there are automatic disclosures that you need to make. You need to produce a witness list. You need to go ahead and hand over any documents that you have. In case of our clients we are we have whatever we have and it doesn't necessarily impact our case a whole lot we have whatever's been served on us we might have loan modification applications um, and I think that's about it as far as what would be relevant what we just turn those all turn those over it's the plaintiffs that really don't want to engage in discovery in the case of a predatory lender like Eastern they don't really want us to know their practices so um, at the at this conference, and I was not successful. Um, I'm not, I don't think I was successful at this one, but I had been successful previously. But one of my tips would be to go ahead and ask the magistrate to order them to just turn over the loan file. It's they have a loan file. It's it's all going to be relevant to their case and your client's case and. You shouldn't really have to even ask for that formally. Um, you should be aware that discovery, settlement conferences, and everything else goes really quick. And in this particular case, um, when we got to the point of scheduling discovery, they gave us a really tight time frame. So you've got to pay attention and realize that it may not be possible for you to do all your discovery in two or three months. In fact, it's not possible. Um, Plaintiffs like Eastern and probably other banks are going to push back and say there isn't any need for any discovery. 
And that's what happened in this case. Um, I'm just going to move on. I, I see I'm, I'm taking too much time here. So the next few pages of the docket sheet looking at 50, 51, and 52 is all about this uh, dual track of discovery and settlement conferences. So while we were um, propounding discovery requests and responding to their requests and trying to schedule depositions and getting a lot of uh, resistance from plaintiff, we were also pursuing settlement. We, I was lucky that the client had an increase in income, so as the case went on, we were able to offer a little bit more and show that um, that she was making efforts, that she was trying to reduce expenses and increase income, and plaintiff wasn't really getting any better on their offers while we were able to offer a higher payment. Some of the things that I did during this process was trying to humanize my client, discussing, you know, what the family situation was, the fact that my client had gone out and gotten a college degree during the time she was in default so that she, and gotten a better job and gotten a promotion. Um, try to have the conferences in person so that your magistrate can see your client as a flesh and blood, you know, human being. Um, I was always uh, making offers, making detailed offers and saying, this is what my client can afford, this is the interest rate, this is how it relates to what the rest of the industry does. And by the end of the case, the magistrate was very irritated at Eastern because of their um, refusal to budge and to insist on a, a 9% or an 8% interest rate that she knew was you know, way above market rate and that they could not get if they were going out in the market then. Uh, and I also kept talking about good faith, good faith, good faith. They're not negotiating in good faith. Um, some of, so we did eventually have some motion practice with discovery, and that is in your materials at, um, at page 83, um, there's a letter motion for a uh, protective order from Eastern. So Eastern's position from the outset was this is just a garden variety foreclosure, you know. They basically felt that we didn't deserve any discovery. And, and that's not the case under the federal rules. The federal rules are much broader. I'm going to go to the scope of discovery. This is uh, the next slide is just some lists of rules, which I think Megan went over, how you, you have to check your, your individual judge's rules. Okay, so um, in, the Eastern, in the Southern and Eastern District, there are some really specific rules on discovery. I, I did look at the Western and Northern District rules, and they don't seem to be quite as specific. But under the federal rules, um, you've, got to, you've got to disclose. You can't hold it back. Uh, and you can't hold something back because just because you don't think uh, it's relevant or because you think it's a trade secret. You, you, you've got to have a really good basis to withhold something. And if something is privileged, you can't just say there's a bunch of privileged stuff. You've got to state in detail what you're holding back and what's the basis of the privilege. Um, so the basic scope of discovery under the federal rules is any non-privileged matter relevant to any party's claim or defense. As a defendant, you're going to have some claims that might relate to underwriting, that might relate to the marketing or targeting a predatory loan. And so you, you, you're going to have possibly some discovery requests for documents or possibly for interrogatories relating to the bank's overall practices and not just your client's loan. Um, and they're going to push back on that. The uh, discovery that you're seeking need not be admissible at trial. It only needs to be reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of admissible evidence. So going back to our case, um, in this motion for a protective order, on, at page 83 of your materials, Eastern um, was trying to restrict the scope of the rule, Federal Rule 30b-6 deposition, which was the deposition of the plaintiff. 
eventually, if you go back to the docket sheet, I'm going to find that page. We got an order after uh, you see these little letters, and th that letter is the entire briefing on your motion. You get a three page letter motion, and that's about it. So if you go to page 53, you'll see the minute order for the motion hearing. So the magistrate basically heard us argue this over the phone for 10 or 15 minutes. She looked at our little three-page letters. She limited some of the scope of deposition, and she, um, but she pretty much kept most of what we wanted in. We proceeded. We, uh, I deposed um, the first person that they designated who really didn't know very much, and and actually said that she'd been instructed not to um, make inquiry into some of the topics of the deposition. And then eventually I was allowed to depose an underwriter. So as settlement conferences went on, um, we still weren't getting anywhere. Now we got to, I'm going to try to speed up, we got to the point where discovery was completed. And it was time for plaintiff to make their pre-motion conference letter for summary judgment. In response, we were planning to cross-move for interest tolling. And at that point, I don't think this, the letter is in the materials. Our, our pre-motion conference letter is at page 89 of your materials. At that point, um, the plaintiff had to make, uh, they had to basically put their case for summary judgment in the pre-motion conference letter. And in the interim, we changed judges from Judge Mouskoff to Judge Chen, who was an Obama appointee. I love Judge Chen. When Eastern came to move for summary judgment, they, they realized that, no, they hadn't actually served an RPAPL 1303 notice. And they pretty much admitted it in their letter. And in response, um, well, let me back up. They proposed a couple of uh, do-overs, which Ultimately, the court did not accept. So after we did these letters, we had the pre-motion conference, and that's on the docket sheet at page uh, 54 on 6-19-2014. Um, and the judges, it's sort of her determination. She didn't really make a ruling because there was no motion, but after we briefed the issue of plaintiff being uh, being able to withdraw their case without prejudice, it was our position that they couldn't, that it would be dismissed with prejudice. Uh, it's not called discontinuance in federal court. It's called dismissal. Um, Judge Chen came down on our side and said that it would have to be dismissed at, at a minimum with without prejudice, but she was tending to dismissed with prejudice based on the equitable factors. At that point, we got a complete sea change. And you'll see that there was another scheduling order. And on pages 54 and 55, we had a lot more settlement conferences. And we eventually settled and got a loan modification for the clients. Um, I guess both sides were unhappy. Both sides had to really stretch. But we settled this case, and I think we got something that no one had ever gotten out of this bank, which was significant a waiver of some of the back interest, uh, lowering the rate to something a little more human, which was 5.5, although it, it, it increased, and, um, and some forbearance. So we, we got to something that was m much more of an affordable payment for our client. So I guess I'm going to open it for questions now if we have any more minutes left. We do have a little bit more time. So one question we have so far it has to do, uh, again, with housing counselors. So have you heard of or encountered a situation where the borrower was working with a housing counselor prior to being referred to legal services uh, for filing of the answer in um, for the conference? hopefully conference, uh, and the housing counselor was appeared was ordered to appear in court as a witness for the defendant. I have not, I haven't had that experience. I've, I've worked with a lot of people that have been working with housing counselors. I sometimes 
uh, am representing someone and a housing counselor is doing their loan modification application, but I have never heard of them being called as a witness. I, I mean, I would, I've had a case where I wanted to call a housing counselor as a witness, but it, it never panned out. Okay. So far, those are the only questions that we have. Oh, I lied. Okay. So what has been your experience with motions to vacate default and to file a late answer? I have not had that experience in federal court. In the two cases where I filed an answer, uh, we were either we, we were on time and we got an extension, or in this case we had an extension already. Um, I have looked at the dockets in some other cases. I think that the federal courts uh, probably do want to decide cases on the merits, but I would be surprised if they would be as lenient as some of the state courts are in terms of granting late answer motions uh, several years after a case is filed. In a, I mean, in, in a federal case, the case isn't going to linger for several years, so there's probably a tighter time frame in which a party needs to move, and and the um, the borrower that defaults probably needs a good excuse, and they need an advocate to make that motion for them to make the, the best case possible for the late answer. So I really can't comment on the how the federal courts fall on late answers as opposed to state courts. Jay has a lot more federal court experience, so he may be able to, to speak to that in, in terms of federal courts, not necessarily in foreclosures, but just in general. Yeah, so this is Jay. The only thing I would say is, here we haven't had any experience in, in foreclosure cases in federal court where we move to, to vacate uh, a default or, or for leave to put in a late answer. And in my previous life, we were never in that situation. We were always you know, pretty much doing it timely or, or doing it with, with consensual adjournments. I suspect the standards are somewhat akin to what they are in, in state court, um, but um, things will have happened very quickly. So it's going to be harder to undo, I imagine, um, in federal court. So the, the main thing I would say to the housing counselors who are, who are, who are on the call is if you see um, a, a homeowner come to you who's got a federal complaint, don't delay at all. They really need to get in front of a, a lawyer right away. Um, that would be what I would urge people to do. Okay. And I, I would also just say for the housing counselors, I just wanted to say, because I didn't mention this earlier when there was a question, if you're a housing counselor and you're working with a borrower and they are in federal court, you've got to realize that your time frames are going to be cut in half. Most likely your servicer is not going to wait 60 or 90 days to review your application. But by the same token, you're not going to have 60 days to get that package together. You're going to have two weeks, three weeks, and you're going to have to have your documents together and your ducks in a row. So you, you, everything is sped up in federal court, and you've you just got to up your game. The clients got to up their game. They've they've got to get you everything. I know a lot of times clients don't get us their documents, but if they're in federal court, just know that everything is going to happen twice as fast. Okay, so it's one thirty-one now. I just want to make sure that folks are noting the CLE verification code in the chat box in your dashboard. Uh, we do have one more question that I think we probably have time for. Um, so let me read that out loud. Uh, if the original lend lending institution was a New York corporation and upon default immediately transferred the defaulted loan to securitized asset backed trust, would you consider trying to drag the original lender back into the case in the answer via counterclaims? Um, not necessarily. I mean, if, if the um, so if the loan is the scenario that the loan was transferred after it was already in default is that the scenario? Upon default, they immediately upon transferred. default. Okay, yep. so if they transfer a loan when it's in default, you could make a case that the transferee is not a holder in due course because they took the loan in default. Um, it's. I, I don't know. I, I guess you could try it, but I guess that I would I would probably allege both. I don't I don't know if I would try to bring in 
the previous uh, the previous lender. One of the, I, I I might not want them around because the the new lender has got to um, be able to allege all the facts that they need to allege to make out their case. So I don't know if I want the previous lender. And I, I guess it would depend on. You said the new lender is a trust. I mean, the real party that's going to be making decisions is a servicer anyway. So. Uh, he, he added also that the loan, the interest rate had was a predatory interest rate. I, predatory uh, loan. I, interest rate. So this, yeah, this I guess if you're talking questions. about you're talking about your origination claims. Right. I, I mean, I, I think I would need a lot more detail. So I think it's not an easy that, question. Yeah, I suggest that that might be one where you perhaps talk it through with each other. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, are there any? It doesn't look like at the moment we have any additional questions. Um, Jay, do you have any? Closing comments you'd like to make? Um, I didn't really um, prepare any closing comments. I would like to thank both uh, Megan and Catherine, who really did an incredible job uh, preparing for this. Um, a lot more work than uh, I perhaps had contemplated. Uh, so I really do appreciate that. Uh, and the only thing I would say is, you know, for those of you who are considering um, uh, moving to dismiss on these abstention theories. Or, or even, and as well as on the, the various other defenses that you might want to move to dismiss on, get in touch with us. Um, we are very happy to share resources and to strategize. And to, you know, I would love to see what happens um, with court deciding on this issue. But I also don't, it's not catastrophic to experiment with this theory because as Catherine's example shows, you know, the worst that's going to happen is they say no, but you have, will have in the process educated them about what New York foreclosure law is, and you may get yourself a better uh, settlement conference process. As I said at the beginning, my real concern is for those who don't have access to us. So I'm trying to deter, um, you know, lenders getting the idea that it's a good idea to go and try to prosecute these cases in federal courts and, and evade our protections and get quick judgments. Um, but for those who we're representing, there isn't that much of a downside because the worst that's going to happen is the court is going to say, "No, I'm not going to abstain." And then you'll go do what you were going to do, and you will have in the process uh, educated the courts. So I would encourage people, uh, even though this entails a little bit of work, um, I think it's worth worth pursuing. So I'm I'm happy to help out with this kind of stuff. So, and okay. thanks very much for listening. So um, to mirror what Jay is saying, Megan, thank you. Catherine, thank you. Jay as well, um, thank you for moderating this and adding your perspective in it. Uh, Michelle, do we have anything else for folks? Uh, no, just a reminder to complete your uh, your webinar evaluation at the end as well. All right, great. Thank you, everybody, and have a nice.